Welcome to this recorded video that will go over part A of the module two Python basics that we're covering in this class. So I broke up the lecture notebooks for the second module into four separate notebooks labeled part A, part B, part C, and part D. So we focus on presenting simply the basics of Python for scientific computing in this module. It is intended only to help break down the barriers of entry into using Python, as well as introducing some of the basic tools that we use in scientific computing that are then commonly used in data science. While we progress through more advanced topics in this course, there is no single course or even sequence of courses for that matter that can possibly cover all that Python has to offer. I provide some links here that you should click on and explore. For instance, the SciPy one is fantastic, where it describes various useful libraries that you could click on, such as SciPy itself, and look at its documentation. And within these documentations, you can often find useful tutorials and other information uh, to go through if you just do a little bit of exploring. And in fact, there's a tutorial right here, the Python tutorial. This was that first link that I had, and it has a lot of information um, that you might find useful for the basics of Python, including data types and structures and errors and exceptions and classes. It's, it's quite useful, very comprehensive. So the learning objectives for our part A is we wanna understand some of the more commonly used data types. We are going to assign values to variables and perform basic arithmetic operations and understand those operations. Along the way, we are also going to understand how to read error messages and do some basic debugging with the many exercises, really these activities that I have embedded in here. This is perhaps the most important thing that we're gonna figure out, we're gonna learn how to do, is how to read error messages and, and do some basic debugging. Because that's a lot of programming, it's just fixing errors. Along the way, we're going to use some built-in functions within Python. In particular, we're going to make uh, a we're going to get a lot of use out of the print, type, and range functions. You can find more information about those functions and other built-in functions with at this link here. This has some built-in functions here, and you can look at, for instance, type or print. So right, there's print and there's type and there's range and the list and length. This this command this is part of an assignment involves the len command, which takes lengths of things. That's very useful. So there's some useful commands here that you can read about. Some of them have examples. You can scroll through. You can click here to just go straight to like how do I use type? What does it look like? But mostly this is self-contained. But those are useful links to help explore for you to explore your understanding or just to deepen your understanding, I should say, and do some exploratory uh, learning on your own. So we are going to just do an introduction to variables here. There are four activities uh, for you to complete. There's also some instructor-led activities in here that I will complete. I will just at least read through these basic activities for you in this lecture, in this recorded video. And the summary activity is now something that I really want to stress. I, I started it for you, but it's really a place for you to summarize what you've learned in a notebook, to look back at it, fill things in, and we'll go over that at the end of this video. So this video will go here, it will replace the, the old one that I had for this the first time I taught the class. So the first types of variables that we are going to see are integers and floats, and we're gonna talk about casting. So some key summary points, I always try to summarize very key points in a list and highlight the key points in some in kind of like a purpled highlighted uh, text. Integers are whole numbers, in case you haven't heard of the term integers before. They can be positive or negative, and they're specified without decimals. So examples are one, two, zero, negative 10. Those are all integers. Floats, which is short for floating point numbers, are finite representations of real numbers with a finite number of decimal places. Examples are 1.1, 2.3, 0.07, and negative 10.0. Now you notice negative 10 and negative 10.0, those are actually considered different types of numbers in Python, as in most programming languages. This is an integer, negative 10, negative 10.0. If you type that, that is a float. Now, when you do an arithmetic operation involving variables of different types, what will happen is the result will be cast as a type that is general, generally the most variable, the, the, the most general type considered in the operation. So floats would be considered more general than integers. For instance, 
right? Negative 10.0, it, it looks just like negative 10 except for the 0, .0. So you could think of negative 10 as belonging to a float if you just represent it with a point with adding a 0, .0 to it. But 0 .07 has no representation in the integers. So there's, in some sense, more floats than there are integers. An arithmetic operation cast the either the type of the most general variable using the operation or as the type of output generally expected from the operation all right so that's something to consider and i show examples of what's going on here so whether or not we worry about casting depends upon what result we desire from the operation because sometimes we need an integer sometimes we need a float it can depend on what the output's supposed to be so we'll see this uh, and we we can actually specify the casting if we want so I provide lots of code comments in these code cells that follow. You should read these code comments. You should try some of this stuff. Like for instance, here's an integer that I call one underscore int and I make it equal to one. And then one underscore float, I make it a 1.0. And I point out, I don't need to have it 1.0. I could just do one point and that would also make it a float, but that looks weird. So I don't recommend that. So you could try it, but in, in, it's for you to try. And here's an integer type that's two, two as an integer. So when I run this and move to the next cell, there is no output. All I've done is assign variables. There's no output to display there. And now what I can do is display some outputs. And I provide lots of code comments here. And again, you should read through these very carefully. This prints a blank line, just a print uh, function. And you use the parentheses there because it's a function. So think of like a function as like, f of x you think of like print print what but if i have print with nothing this will just print a blank line and then what i do is i print the types of integers so here's the built-in python function type and i'm printing the type of one underscore int and one underscore float and in this format when i print this you see this space right here this blank space right here is because i printed a blank line with this, if I comment that out, and then I run this again, that blank line disappears. If I want multiple blank lines, oops, I could do that, and now look what happens. There's quite a bit of white space between there. So usually we just print blank lines because it helps us read and distinguish the different parts of the code and the output. So I printed a blank line here, and maybe Maybe I could, maybe I want to print a blank line after it to really give it some space so that it's, it's very clearly distinguished from the code cells. It's up to you. You can add whatever you like. I also show how this is one function call and notice, notice how that parenthesis right there, when I, when you move through the parentheses with the cursor, it's highlighted in green. It's green here. It's green here. It's part of the same function call. I'm printing this entire statement, even though it's across two lines. I broke it up because I'm using the comma with this print command to break up a long statement across multiple lines to help with the readability of the code. And if you were to just start using the arrow key, you would notice the green highlighting of the parentheses changes as I go through things so that you can make sure that you're matching pairs of parentheses together. So I'm printing all this text along with the types of variables. All right. And you can see one underscore int is of type. It is a integer type. It is of class int. And one underscore float is of type class. It's a float. So it's an, there's an int and there's a float. That's what one underscore int and one underscore float are. You can also use a backslash n within a text string, which is with, those, with the text that's within these single tick marks. That's next, you could use single tick marks or you can use double quotes, but they need to match. So if they're both double, uh, see, it always wants to do auto close. They can either both be double or both be single. I would say that the standard use single tick marks, single tick marks. See this backslash in, watch what happens now. When I run this, I'll do control enter. One int is of type int, one float is of type float. As opposed to the single line, this addition of this backslash n right there, it's separated into new lines. And you might say, well, that's why is it backslash n? And then, you know, why don't you have that space? If I did that, you can see what happens. It created a little bit of an indent, which looks weird. And so 
that backslash in, what immediately follows it, that backslash in, that's a new line command. And if I put that there, then I can put text right up next to it, and that will help align everything nicely so the output looks nice. So sometimes print commands can look a little weird when you have this backslash in for new line commands. Uh, you could get around that if you don't like that. I could add a, t a tick mark there, and then there we go. So let's see what happens. See, well, actually, no, it doesn't work out that way, actually, because it does. Um, I'll just get it back there. There we go. I knew I had it that way for a reason originally. This is what you need. It just kind of looks a little bit weird there. Um, but you'll get used to it. You'll see you just kind of look right past these backslash ins, and in your mind, you just start to say, that's a new line command. It's a new line command. But it might look a little weird or take a little getting used to. So you can also do multiple backslash ends to create some nice white space. Maybe you want to make it a little bit more readable. So there's a white space now, uh, a blank line between that sentence of one int is of type int and one float is of type float. Another option, here I'm putting back, you know, I'm just showing you where I put this backslash in, these new line commands at different places. One int is of type int, one float is of type float, and I've just separated everything out. Um, I'm using backslash ends here as well to just print out variables. And one of the things I'm doing here is showing casting. So the variable to underscore int we know is an int. So it's of type int. If I add two type two integer types of variables together, like one and two, then I'm not interested in the what the output value is. We know one plus two is three, but the output type is an integer. But if I divide an integer by an integer, the output is a float because one divided by two is 0 0.5. The expected output is 0 0.5, which is a floating point type. What happens if I take a floating point type and I divide it by an int? Well, it's also a float, right? So it doesn't matter whether I divide the int uh, by an int or a float by an int, then I still get a float because the expected output from a division is going to be a floating point type. That's the, expe that's the expectation when you do division. So then I say, well, look what happens. If I add one plus one, we'll see what the output is. But look what happens when I add one plus uh, one where it's not, it's an integer plus a float. So we'll run this and see what happens. One plus one is two. One plus one is also two, but look at this, it's 2.0 because I added the integer one to the float one. So now it's one plus 1.0. It's going, this is the more general type. So it's gonna make it a 2.0. And you can see the class of that is a float. The variable defined by one underscore int plus one underscore float is of type float. So then there's some outputs. Um, yeah, I already mentioned this involving division. When you divide, uh, let's say three or negative one, and you start doing some division and see what's going on. So then, so that shows you these outputs here. One divided by two is 0.5, two divided by three is about two thirds, and negative one divided by two is negative 0.5. But now look what happens in this next code cell. I use double backslashes instead of just a single back, or excuse me, forward slash, that's a forward slash. I use one slash here to do regular division in this previous code cell. Now I use two slashes down below. Scroll down, see I'm using two slashes two forward slashes. So what does that do? That does an integer division, which is sometimes called floor division. So you should read this carefully and say, what does that mean for casting? If you run this, you will see that now when I take one divided by two, but I do as an integer, it's zero. When I do 1.0 divided by two, it's 0, 0.0. When I do negative 1.0 divided by two, it's negative 1.0. So what's going on? It's rounding down to the nearest integer. So that might be useful in some context. And so that's why I'm showing it to you here. So this is a different type of arithmetic operation where it's going to do the division like you did here, but it's going to round it down to the nearest integer, but it still might leave it as a floating point if one of the, uh, one of the variable types was a float. If neither variable types were a float, the output is an integer type, you see it's like zero, but if it's 1.0 divided by two in the integer divide, then it's 0, 0.0. So now I'm going to lead you in an activity about reading error messages and fixing code.
And this just involves some things using things that we've seen above. This is very similar to this activity for you to do. You notice the instructions look identical, just about identical. So in this activity, the code block below will not execute correctly. The first thing to do is to try running it. The next thing to do is to read the error messages as you systematically fix it. And I say error messages, because what's gonna happen is as we keep fixing one thing, there's gonna be multiple errors that we have to fix. So the first thing to do is to just try running this. I'll, I'll press Control, Enter on my keyboard. And now look, it says, there is an error, a syntax error. And it has this caret that points to where it is. It says it happened right after one half equal, and then there was nothing there. And it says that's an invalid syntax because we have a variable equal to nothing. And moreover, it tells us it's on line one. And you might say, where's line one? Well, it's the first line. It's actually gonna tell you where the first, as soon as there's an error, the code will just stop and it will tell you the line number where it occurred. And you, sometimes if there's not that many line numbers, it's pretty easy to say, hey, that's the first line, here's the second, here's the third. If you wanted to see the line numbers, so you can go to, I believe it's uh, view, and let's see, line show line numbers. So now if I say show line numbers, there are the line numbers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's nine lines in this code cell. So now it's a lot easier to debug because I have the line numbers. Well, what should one half be? 0 0.5, that's what one half should be, 0 0.5. Or I can make it one divided by two, it's up to you, but I'll make it 0 0.5. I guess it's somewhat up to me because it's an instructor-led activity. So now I run that and I, or now I run this, I try to run, I say, oh, now there's an error on line seven. So fixing that got us all the way to line seven, but now it's saying, hey, there's another syntax error, not one half, is over here. And so I go, well, what's not one half? And if I look back, I kind of realize, oh, you know what? I'm going a little too fast. If I look at what the code was trying to do, the output of one int divided by two int is one half. That's what I was really supposed to put here. I was supposed to define a variable in terms of an operation of two others. And then similarly, I see that this output is supposed to be one int divided with an integer divide of two int is there. Okay, now I've defined that variable. I've actually paused and read the print instructions. I did that on purpose, because you might just say, well, one half, that clearly has to be 0 0.5. But if you look at how I'm using it, it's meant to be the output of an operation between two variables, just like not one half is meant to be the output of this operation between two variables. So now if I try to run this, Ah, oh, there's still another error. It's on line nine now, here's line nine. And where does it point to? It says, is of type, it says invalid syntax, and it's pointing to the start of type. You say, why is it pointing to the start of type? Because you'd say, well, type itself is empty. That might be the first thing you notice. Well, actually, between different outputs that are in the print command, I'm using commas. And there's no comma here, which is why they're putting a caret, this, this symbol, to say there's an error right here because this is not a proper syntax. So if I fix that, and then I try to run it again, there's still another error. It's saying on this print command, this type right here didn't have any arguments associated with it. Type is supposed to take in arguments. Of course, it's blank. Every other time we've used type anywhere in the code, uh, I have to scroll up a little bit, a little bit more, here we go. Anytime we've ever used type in previous code cells, type, 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 we've actually passed it a variable to say the type of what. Type is expecting some sort of input. So we come here and we say, all right, type, this needs to be not one half. Now when I run it, oh, finally, I have fixed all the errors in this. So that is it. That is how you kind of systematically go through and fix error messages. You look at the line number, you look at where the caret's pointing to to say this is where the error seems to occur, and you have to make sense of, well, what should be there in order to make this work? You have something similar here for your activity where you have to read error messages and fix code. You'll notice four is not defined anywhere and this type is empty. So those are some hints for you. All right, I'm going to just clear this off because you should try to fill these things in for yourself. All right, there we go. I'll get my error back starting there.
Now, specifying casting. Some key points. We can specify how we want an integer or float to be treated to allow for greater control in the code. This is very important. This is very useful in a lot of contexts, especially when we start doing looping. This is also referred to as casting. Whenever we specify that a variable should be treated as a different type from what it is in a particular context. So I just show two functions for casting below, the int and float cast. So you can force things to be of a particular type by, make, by treating int and float as functions. To see how this works, look, here is the variable two. It is equal to the integer one plus the float one variable. And when I run that, I say, yes, two equals 2.0 is of type float. But imagine I wanted the type to be an integer. Well, I know that an integer plus an integer gives me an integer, so I can use the int function to cast the float of one the 1.0 that is one underscore float as an integer. So now when I do that, two is now an integer, even though we did not change actually one as a float. We just changed it in the instance in which it is used. So to, it, it was treated like an integer in this operation, but it did not fundamentally change what it was because we still see that one underscore float is still of type float. So if you look here, I make a variable x that's equal to negative 3.7. This of course is of type float. If I cast it as an integer, let's see what happens. It simply drops off the 0.7. It doesn't round down to the nearest integer. It just drops off all the decimal points. And it says the int, the int of x is just negative three. That's the integer part of the number. And then I also show that you can change integers to floats because for instance, if I take the integer one and I say, make it into a float using the float command, float of one int, now all of a sudden the what was just one is now 1.0, but only in that instance. It doesn't change what one int is anywhere else. I give you some more practice here where y should cast an integer of x as a float. And then you have to print things out. So there's gonna be some errors here and you're gonna to have to fix them. So this is an activity for you to do. It's very similar to what we did before. Just look at the instructions and the code comment carefully. If you find that you want to raise a variable to a power, you use two asterisks, the, which is our standard, which is doubling the multiplication, in, so to speak. You don't use a caret like you might be used to from calculators. So for instance, 0.1, 0 0.1, if I want to cube it, I do times times three, all right? That's 0.1 raised to the third power. You can see that's 0 0.001. And by the way, notice that there's this 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, there's a bunch of zeros and then a two. That's because floating point numbers have finite precision and the way they're stored in memory in terms of just a, a bunch of zeros and ones that have to be interpreted as a number and is gonna to lead to some sort of rounding errors. So that's, that's really a topic more for numerical analysis. It's very important when you get into uh, computation, more deeply into computational science. If you find that you ever have to deal with complex numbers, um, so here I'm gonna use J uh, for the square root of negative one. That's an electrical engineering convention because they use I for current. And there, the letter J is what's used in Python, right? It uses the electrical engineering convention. So you can assign the variable J to anything you want. But if you wanna treat a number, like it's a complex number, you just put the J right next to the part you want to be complex. So I'm just gonna show this here. So alpha is equal to three minus four j. This is not the same thing as three minus four times j, right? That's what I show down here. If j equals 3.6483, whatever this number is that I made here, then three minus four times j is this. But if you just write four j, right? Not four times j, just four j, it will always treat that as if you meant to multiply by the square root of negative one to make that a complex number. If you haven't seen complex numbers before, don't worry about it. This is really about the only time I talk about it in the whole class. But for those of you that are gonna use Python in other settings, if you're gonna do anything with engineers, 
or real computational science in the future, you might come across this. So it's just good to know and be aware of. But I'm not gonna say much about that. That's why it's a real short part of this lecture notebook. Strings are very important. Some key points about strings, many binary operations like that you're familiar with, like division, don't work with strings. But addition does, except it means to concatenate two strings into one. Concatenation just means you put one right after the other. It's very useful when creating file names for saving and loading data in loops. Having a strenuous uh, start, yeah, asterisk there, I'm not sure why. So I'll try to fix that when I give it to you. I use this a lot. We can create multiple, we can also create multiples of the text, meaning we can multiply. So for instance, I'll show you how this works. If I make some text that's equal to the string hello, so I use the single tick marks and I say oh, I have a string called hello that's stored as the variable text. If I use this notation plus equals, text plus equals, this is the same thing as saying text equals text plus, right? It's just a shorthand notation so that I can add something to it. So this will now create the text hello with a comma, a space, and then world, and then a space, colon, space. So I'll just run this and you'll see this other part, but we'll talk about it in a second. Hello world. So that's how I added to a string. I just simply, by adding, it just put this part of the string and it just put it right after that part of the string and it made it a single variable. That's what that plus equal did. And I could have created a different string variable altogether. Text more. I could have done it like this. And then I could have said text more like that. So there's your hello world. Hello world. Okay. And then text times equal will create multiples of text. Now here, text is just equal to hello now. So then if I say times equals three, this is the same thing as saying text equals three times text. What does that do? Look, it created three copies of the word hello. That's all it did. And it stored it again as the variable text, just overwrote it. So I could say here, text more equals three times text. Oops. And again, there you go. There's your hello, hello, hello. So text more is either text plus world or it's three times text. But if I don't want to create additional variables, then we just go back to the way I had it. So I'm just undoing everything I did there. So there you go. I'm back to the way it was. And I'm just using the shorthand notation for adding something to an existing variable or multiplying something to an existing variable. And multiplying a number, an integer type to text will create multiples of it. So notice how I have three copies of hello world here when I do text. Now, what happens if I try to multiply 3.0? I will get an error because why? Where does it occur? On line seven, right there, where I try to multiply by the float, it created a type error. You cannot multiply a sequence, and so it's treating the integer, the uh, string like a sequence by some non-int of type float. It has to be an integer. So let's go back there, make it an integer. There we go, everything works now. And you might imagine like maybe you did operations to figure out how many times you wanted to create a copy of a text. And so then all of a sudden, maybe the, the those operations could produce floats, but you just wanted the integer part, then you could always do that. And now it works because that's cast as the type it needs to be. So I'll just go back to the way it was. There we go. All right. Due to casting, printing a variable without its type may lead you into thinking a variable is of a different type than it actually is. So for instance, right? If I make a string variable one, which is now this, this means it's like a text. It's just the text one, like the symbol one, but not the number one. If I just look at it, so here we go, it, and I printed that variable, it's a one, but it's actually of class string. It's a string type. But then if I made an integer out of it by casting, so I turn it into an integer and assign it to the variable one underscore int, then when I print this one underscore int, that will be of type int. Now look at those. If you just printed one int in one string, 
printing them looks exactly the same. It's only by looking at the type of them that you realize they're different, even though they appear the same when you print them to screen. That's very important because if you start getting weird errors or unexpected outputs, it could be because of casting. So there's some more here too. I turn also one string into a float and I show it makes it a 1.0. And then I take that float and I cast it back as a string. So again, 1.0 and 1.0, they printed the same, but they're of different types. One's a float and one's a string because of the casting that I've done here and then assigning them to specific variables. So there's some string multiplication is useful for creating clear separation between printed outputs. So maybe I wanna have, well, I'll just run this and you can see, Perhaps I want to just distinguish like some distinguishing line, a dividing line or barrier between different types of things I'm printing out. Then I could take like a dash as a string, multiply it by 50, I'll create 50 dashes. But you could have done this with, you know, tildes and run it. There's a different type of dividing line. You could do it with equal sign. You could do it with, let's say, a times. There you go. There's all sorts of things you could do. You could just be, you know, you just have a bunch of dividing lines. That doesn't look so great. That looks ridiculous. So we'll just stick with the dash. But you might find that you like a particular style. Maybe pluses are sometimes really nice for creating a nice barrier or whatever. You get, you, hopefully you get the idea. You could, there's an interesting kind of stylistic one here. I can, I don't need 50 of them there, maybe 10. There. So you could do whatever you want. You can, you can play around with this, see what's going on. I'm just, I, I'll stop screwing around and I'll make this back to 50. There we go. And sometimes we want to evaluate mathematical expressions stored as strings. The eval function, again, that's a built-in uh, Python function, allows that. So imagine you take my expression and you might create a string that's like, it's the one float plus one float. And that could be because you have variables of certain types and you're going and just grabbing the variable names and putting them together into a string argument. And you could look, if you print my expression, that's just a string, one float plus one float. But if you print the evaluation of that expression, because these are actual variables, it will then evaluate. Uh, it is expecting that everything is evaluated, that, that everything can be evaluated by Python then if you use the eval command, uh, eval function. Okay, an instructor-led activity. Practice with casting and printing. Use the comments in the code cell below to help fill in the missing pieces of the code that creates and prints the string variable str underscore var, the string underscore variable. So these instructions, again, use the comments in the code cell to help fill in the missing pieces. So everything's within the comments. So let's look at what's going on. I make x equal to the string 0.5. This comment says, I would like to cast X as a float and then cast X as a string. So I wanna cast X as a float and then I wanna cast it as a string. So this is what I'm asking to do. It's a string of a float. It's, it's very much just like a composition of functions. First I cast it as a float, then I cast it as a string. So the string's on the outside. It's the last thing I do. Then, on this code comment, I see that I cast x as an integer and then cast it as a string. Okay, if I cast x as an integer, integer x, right? Let's just first do that because notice I say you need to use the eval function here. Let's just look at what happens. I got a value error. What's going on? It said there's an invalid literal for an integer with base 10, 0 0.5. It's saying you can't turn a string of 0 0.5 into an integer. So the first thing I need to do is actually evaluate x as a number because integers expecting us a float to operate on. At least if it's of that 0 0.5 type, it can't do it when it's a string. So here I need to do that and then I can at least evaluate this and then, of course, I need to cast it as a string. So that, when you read through all this, I'm just showing you so that you know what to do. Now I can say, now create this as a string. So now at the end, I did a float into a string. I did an integer into a string. But that integer required me to evaluate x because the x was not a string version of an integer. All right? That's an important thing right there.
And so then I create this string variable and I use that plus equals here to do concatenation. So I'm just saying, put all this stuff together and break up the arguments and then I print what that string variable is. And you can see I use the backslash n to create different new lines. 0.5 is the variable we start with, which is then turned into the float 0.5 and is also turned into the integer zero. That is all that was done right here. So now I'm going to undo all of that because you should try to fill that in after watching the video. And now I have you do an activity practicing with casting and printing. And it's the same instructions. Use the comments in the code cell to try to follow along and fill in the missing pieces. So you might try running the code cell, seeing where the errors occur, because there's missing parts, but you should be able to hopefully fill this all out. I then get into the who's who in memory. So this is your first magic command in uh, IPython. So we're in an interactive Python environment. Magic commands are conventionally prefaced with a percent sign. So the percent sign who's, if I run this, what that will do is tell me who's in memory. And it's gonna show me all the variables. It's gonna show me all their types and it's gonna give me some information about the data. So you can see kind of all the variables that we've created so far in our code executions to this point. There's a list of other available magic commands at the line level. So this is this output here. There's a lot of things here. I don't expect you to go through and use all of this. The most useful one here is in the cell as well. You can try to read more about this if you like. I'm not gonna press you on it but whose is very useful for you to do any kind of debugging. Now, we're gonna finish up this notebook with a very important variable type, lists. So Python lists are very, very flexible, but they're generally not as useful in computational problems as NumPy arrays are, which is something that we're gonna see in another notebook in this module. But lists are very flexible and they're very useful in a lot of settings. So lists are ordered arrays of almost any type of variable or mixed types of variables you can think of using in Python. You can even make a list of lists, and we do this in your homework. You use lists when the order matters in the code, when you plan on looping through elements of the list in some ordered way, as an example. Other popular ways to handle data structures include dictionaries and sets. And so I provide a link here for that, and we'll talk about dictionaries as well in your assignment and later on in this notebook very briefly. An important thing to understand in Python is indexing starts at zero. This means that the first element of a list is indexed by a zero. The second element is indexed by a one. That might seem confusing at first, but don't worry, you'll get used to it. It's very common in a lot of programming languages. Some programming languages are exceptions like MATLAB, but most languages, most sophisticated programming languages start indexing with a zero. So I show this here, I create a list of floats with 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0. I print the list. I show you what list multiplication does. What do you think two times the list does? And you know, just think about that before you run it. And then, because there's two options. Does it take that two and multiply it to everything in the list? Or does it create copies of the list much like string multiplication? I'm showing you what the zeroth entry is of the list. And then I take that zeroth entry and I multiply it by two. So this is the first entry, I should say. This, I'll often say the zeroth and it means the first. And then I will print the list at the end again, just to show you that nothing changed in that list through all those operations. So you see the list multiplication times two, that created two, it just basically took the list and it created a copy of it. It, it, just, it just created a new list that was twice as long but it had all the components just repeated. It went one, two, three, one, two, three. That's what list multiplication did. So it acts a lot like string multiplication. And that definitely has some drawbacks when you go to do scientific computing because a lot of times you might just wanna multiply everything in the list by two. And it's not as simple as just saying two times that. You'd have to kind of go through every index and then multiply by two as I showed. If I wanted to change that one to a two and that two to a four and that three to a six, I'd have to loop through every single entry and do that. So that can be pretty annoying. And that's why we'll end up using NumPy arrays for when we have to do more computational oriented programming. But we often use a mix of lists and, and NumPy arrays anyways. It just depends. The 
you'll see in context. The range function is very useful for creating an object to iterate. To, for, it's creating an object that can be iterated over from a starting point to some ending point by a certain step size. So here's some options of it. If I print a range from one to 20 to two, and then I print the type of the range, let's just see what it does. It does not create a list. It creates an iterable object, right? So if I say, hey, print what range from one to 20 by two, I'm saying start at one, go to 20 in steps of two. This is what the output of that print is. What does that mean? It's a class range, it's a type, it's an object that's a, that's a range object. But I can create a list of integers by saying, okay, cast it as a list. This is basically just casting as a list, just like we've seen casting as ints and floats. So now when I do this, I'm going from one to 20 in steps of two, one, three, five, seven. And because I started at one and went in steps of two, 21 would be the next one that's above 20. So it doesn't, it doesn't do that. It just stops at 19. If I instead did, you know, if I started at, you can edit this to whatever you want. If I started at seven, one, eight, 15, right? If I did 17, one, 18, what happens if I gave it a number greater than that? Like 21, just one, one, the next entry would have have to have been 22 and that's greater than 20. So you get the idea, hopefully you get the idea from that. And so then if you notice, this is a list of integers. This was a list of floats. But if I look at what the types are of these, what is the type of int list and the type of float list? They are just considered both lists. Type, the, the type of int list and the type of float list are both considered lists. So the list is just its own type. It doesn't, just, it, it, it doesn't care what's going on inside of, the, uh, inside of the list. You'd have to look at that separately. So if I, I can create a list of lists, and here's, right, I just used the square brackets here. I'm building a list of lists. So I put the float list and then the int list. And now this is my mixed list. It's a, my mixed list is a list of lists. And look at it. The first thing in that list, that mixed list, the first thing of zero, which should really rename this so that it's not mixed list. It should be a list of lists. Maybe that's something that's good for you to edit on your own. You should change mixed list everywhere to list of list. That's a good thing for you to do because it doesn't really make much sense, I think, that variable name given that output. Make it so it all matches. Okay, so the first entry of this list is a list. So right, the zero, when I put in zero or I put in one, which is the first and second entry, notice that the output is actually an entire list. It's the float list and then the int integer list. And then I use this type of indexing to say, okay, that first component of, mix, of that list of lists is a list. And the second component of it, because the Python indexing starts at zero, it gives me 2.0. It's that entry right there. And if I go to this list and I say, what's this, the uh, two, the index two entry, which is the third, I go zero, one, two, it should be five. There it is, five. I can concatenate lists. So maybe I didn't want to make a list of lists. Maybe I just wanted to just put the two lists together. And so I can say, put the integer list and then the float list together. There you go. There's the integer list followed by the uh, float list just all in a row. It's not a list of lists anymore. This is a concatenated list, a concatenated list. So there are some important notes about this. We can build a list of numbers. The group behavior does not match the individual behavior necessarily. For example, in the code above, float list times two produces a list of floats that is not equal to the floats within the list multiplied by two. Um, below, I say below here, but I'm gonna say this in another notebook. I used to have this all together. In another notebook, we work with NumPy arrays, which are lists that behave more like vectors and matrices. And if you're doing actual scientific computations and you need to do matrix and, or vector type of operations, you really wanna use NumPy arrays, not lists. If you have any experience with MATLAB, NumPy arrays should feel very natural to you. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. You're gonna get used to them. You're gonna be exposed to more on list in your assignment um, and some additional manipulations of this data type. And then list comprehensions are special ways of creating lists using loops, functions, and logic. L loops and functions and logic are really topics for uh, 
uh, another lecture. So we only mentioned them here. I should say not, not just next lecture. It's really like for the next uh, for a let me say a future lecture. So th this will all be changed when you get it. You won't see that there. And then I also mentioned some stuff about dictionaries and other data types, and you should read this here. You will see a little bit of this about dictionaries and tuples inside your assignment. So you should read this here. And I, again, I provide links within these things for you to click and say, what, what's going on with list comprehensions and data structures? And you can see how to do stuff here. Um, but you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about it now. I'm just providing the links for you for your own resources. And you might want to create a folder with all of these links in your bookmarks. Now for the activity, which is the summary. In general, pretty much in all notebooks from here on out, you will be asked to summarize some of the key takeaways points at the end of each notebook in a markdown cell like this, right, in this activity cell. So there's all this information here to put between these board, cyan borders. You should write in complete sentences, and it's just, you should state a specific thing that you have learned or seen in the notebook that you found interesting. You have to do at least three, but you're not limited to those three. You can always do more. You're supposed to write things down to really think about what you got out of the lecture. You need to fill in code examples that are related to every single one of the summary points you make. So I got you started here. I made three summary points. In fact, I think I made four. Uh, one, two, yeah, I made four summary points and you need to come up with an additional one. And you, could, uh, you need to come up with at least one additional one. You could come up with more. You just have to add additional markdown and code cells with it. So I give you like as a one summary point that variables of type int, float, string, and list. Um, we So in this notebook, we have seen the following variables of this type, but there are even more types that we have not covered such as dictionaries and tuples. So that's a good summary point. What would be an example is that goes with the summary point, creating a variable of type int, float, string, and list and printing those type and showing that those are of those types with the print and the type commands. And then we can print a screen using print and type to get information. So maybe actually this would be it. Here would be, here would be a better way to do this. Like, you know, you could say five int equals five or five, <laughs> five float equals 5.0, five string equals five and five list equals five like that. And then here you could use the print and type commands. I think you get the idea. You can put and then keep going here. Oh, I should have actually run this cell. Haha, <laughs> silly me. There you go. So, you know, keep going. You could you add the other two there and you could see what they are. You can cast, do the casting. We can do casting. We can uh, use the range function to make lists. So, these are all things that you have to do some code examples. I'm giving you some idea of code examples here. <coughs> Excuse me, I have to clear my throat. All right, I'll just clear that out. Clear it out. So that's it for this notebook. I know this is a little bit of a long video, so thanks for listening all the way through, but it's very thorough. It's guided you through this, and hopefully you have a, a, a fairly straightforward and, and easy time filling in all of this notebook and filling in all of the activities for your grade. So part A and part B are both due in the same week. So I'll have a, the next video will be in the part B notebook and all the activities for part A and part B are due at the end of week two of this class. So thanks for listening and I'll talk to you in the next video.